Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start and do the introduction of Jay. Jay's uh, assistant professor of emergency medicine. He's head of the section of wilderness and environmental medicine, and we were just talking that uh, they've uh, created this collaboration with Outward Bound, and they're developing the curriculum, and it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Damn technology. Uh, two years ago, or last fall, I guess it would be, from Cornell. Uh, and uh, he was just telling me about two books. One book that he's finished with a friend from Stanford that's for kind of lay people on wilderness medicine. And another larger book that uh, he's finishing up. And I tried to tell him when you're finishing up a book, that means it's two years away. <laughs> but uh, it's you said on, that last year. <laughs> yeah, it's on climate change and global health, and uh, and it looks to be a terrific book. So we'll let everybody know when it comes out. So the title of this is the health consequences of a changing climate, and you know it's uh, it's very interesting because I was at the uh, an Aspen Institute. And Tom Friedman gave this very interesting talk on the impact of water and, and showing that water is not only impacting health, but it may be the most important geopolitical resource. Uh, and, and how problems with water are leading to major uh, conflicts. So, Jay, thanks for your willingness to give this talk, and I'm so glad because. Seven minutes ago, it was just three of us in this room. So, uh, thanks again. Thank you. So, plenty of room up front for those that want to come up and be part of the action. Um, but hopefully, you can hear me in the back okay. Um, so, thanks for that introduction. I'm uh, Jay Lemery. I'm a, um, uh, a physician in emergency medicine, and my background has been in. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I was at, I trained in New York in emergency medicine and then became interested in wilderness medicine. And that's really the art and science of taking care of people in remote or austere uh, places. And that's part of what I do. But while I was in New York, um, we began to think about the larger implications of wilderness medicine and those skill sets. So um, how to take care of people during um, disaster situations. And we all been, had all been there during the... Um, of September 11th and so forth. So we, disaster medicine became a part of it. And then we began to think about humanitarian response and global health and the skill sets that, um, improvisational skill sets, how they have overlaps there. And then we began to think about, um, well, I began to think about uh, the connection between climate change or environmental change, I think, is probably a little more accurate because that involves toxins and pollutants and loss of biodiversity and health. And was struck by the conspicuous absence, at least, um, and I know this is a public health forum, but it, particularly in medicine and in, in with clinicians, that there wasn't a good clinician um, voice. And that's really, it just sort of struck with me. And so that's what really led me to this. And so what do I do now? I um, work with some friends at the CDC on just getting this message out, and uh, specifically um, this textbook that we're working on, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, and, uh, and I'll sort of, as the, we go through this lecture, I'll talk about my narrative and sort of what I think we can do with this and what we in medicine can do about it. I'm going to start with talking about just the best evidence out there on climate, how, how our climate is changing, um, how this affects human health. And I think it's important to think about the direct and indirect ways that happens. You're going to hear a word throughout this lecture called vulnerability. And I think that that's going to be sort of the ribbon that runs through the health effects, because it's disproportionate in terms of um, who's being affected the most. And then what we can do about it. Does anyone not know what the IPCC means or is? Everyone knows what that is? That's great. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, we're talking about it. Um, and the reason I ask is I figured most people would, but the last lecture I gave, no one did. So um, the IPCC has been rolling out, the fifth assessment report has been rolling out over the last year, um, or it's going to be rolling out over this, oops, this coming year. And the first iteration just came out 
um, the first part, which is the physical science basis for climate change. But what is it? Well, it was established in 1988 um, by a few different organizations within the UN, and now it's really been embraced by the UN. And the reason it's so important is it's really the sole place where the best science of climate change manages to rise to the top. And I think that that's um, really important, particularly because it's been, um, the science has been in, embroiled with a lot of political issues or political um, uh, stances recently. And so um, the good thing about the IPCC is that if it's in there, it's because the science is impeccable or as best as, as good as it gets because uh, they're not going to put anything that's controversial in there. And I think um, that's the lesson learned from the group that has been doing this since 1988. The fifth assessment report released the physical science basis September 22nd to September 27th. Um, the health section comes out next spring, so for those that are interested, just be, be mindful of that. It's kind of rolling out in waves. And I just want to talk about some of the major findings. Part of my job here today is to um, push the message that we are, we in this room are science communicators. And to me, that's really where all this is going. I think we need better science communications. So part of my job is to um, emphasize what I think are the best sound bites and the best hooks. And I sort of have a larger message at the end. But let's sort of get down to the nitty gritty. What did the latest iteration of the IPC say? I, um, say? Well, climate change is mostly due to human involvement. Up until now, criticism has been that climate science is like a house of cards. If you pull out one or two sets of data, it all collapses. That narrative has been refuted. The observational evidence for human-caused warming is overwhelming, compelling, and irrefutable. So this is the strongest statement yet by the IPCC, and it comes from the, uh, the former chair. And I think that that's the real message, is that this is no longer, at least in mainstream science, debatable. This is sort of fact. You can see here, this is a busy chart, and what they're doing is weighing the evidence of multiple parameters um, of, you know, what's the incidence of uh, raise, high, raising sea levels, what's the confidence that warmer temperatures are indeed caused by this. And I think it's to a credit is that if the science hasn't supported it, supported it they back off. And you can see here, increased intensity in tropical cyclone activity has been downgraded. The data isn't good. Very important, right? It doesn't mean that it's not causative. It just means that it can't be supported by the data. And that's globally in, uh, in, increase in um, cyclone intensity. Almost everything else is the same, and many, much of it is, um, has been corroborated by the science in the last five years. Climate change will affect carbon cycle processes in a way that will exacerbate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. High confidence acidification of the oceans has also been um, um, that data has also um, become more clear. Atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide has, have increased to unprecedented levels, and much of it since pre-industrial times. If you just want to sort of phase out for this part, it's probably okay. All you need to do is look at my arm, okay? This is really the next, like, 10 or 15 slides, okay? That's, that's, that's basically what we're talking about. Here are historical epic fluctuations, whether ice age or non-ice age. So you can see here, and this is going back millions of years. Awesome data. How do they get it? They go in and do the ice core um, of the Greenland ice sheet, and in there there's little bubbles. Has, there, has there anyone here seen um, Chasing Ice? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Oh, that's awesome. So you kind of, Jim Baylog did an amazing job of sort of showing that out. You know where the ice core um, samples are? are stored on Colfax Avenue. There actually, there's a place on Colfax that has the, that has the refrigeration, and I don't know what, what part of the federal agency it's from, but it's, um, I just thought that was great, because it seems like you can get anything on Colfax, and I just didn't see it. <laughs> I just thought that, it just blew me away. I'm new to Denver, so um, it seems like if you ask directions, there's always Colfax in the answer. But you can see here, it gets logarithmic since the uh, Industrial Revolution. You know, this is 1850. Okay, so it doesn't take anyone to realize that this is a, a huge aberrancy. <clears throat> for the first time, the IPC defined an upper limit for carbon dioxide emissions that will uh, be acceptable increase before temperature becomes harmful to humans. 
This is a little vague, um, and the devil's in the details, but they put it at 3.6 degrees. Um, this amounts to one trillion tons of carbon, and since the Industrial Revolution, we've already spent over half of our quote-unquote budget. This past year was when we hit that um, scary number 400, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And they, they measure this at Mauna Loa in Hawaii because it's away from big industrial centers. So it's thought to be a true, as true a sampling as the atmosphere as we can get. Um, the data here doesn't really mean anything except that it hit four, 400 and that's enough to cause a splash in the media, which had yet to be, uh, we had yet to get there. They lowered the bottom end estimate for potential temperature increase that it could occur if uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere doubled. So again, they're, the science is getting better and they're not shying away from promoting best science. And I think that's just, again, I almost want to reemphasize that point. Um, and they gave a very doomsday scenario that average temperature could rise by eight degrees by the end of the 21st century if greenhouse gas emissions are not significantly curbed. And you can see here, um, 1983 to 2012 was likely the warmest 30-year period in the last 1,400 years. You'll have, Molly, I think you'll, they'll have access to all these slides, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And a lot of this is in the IPCC itself for those that are interested in these, these slides. <clears throat> Global average surface warming, you can see the data here, and rates of temperature change over the last century. It was a little awkward. Two weeks ago, I was lecturing in, um, on the Alabama coast and uh, it was hard to explain why that particular part of the country had cooled um, when I'm talking about climate change, but most people got it. Um, projected days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then uh, a comment about the global ocean will continue to warm and uh, it's very likely that we're gonna start to see more um, shrinking of the Arctic ice, Arctic and Antarctic ice caps, which is gonna create all sorts of problems as I'm gonna talk about. Here's the Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover. It's hard to, to read this, but the trend is, is trending down. You can see here the dip was in 2007, so there's definitely yearly fluctuations, but the trend is clear. And this is the minimum that it got in the summer of 07, and you can just see there. Um, for those that are interested in foreign policy, this opens up all sorts of geopolitical implications with the, uh, you know, considering the nations that are the Arctic nations, particularly the US and Russia. Canada. And last year, we, the global warming trends followed the high side of the UN projections. Many scientists are now predicting ice-free, ice-free summer before the uh, before 2016. There's an additive effect to this. It's a positive feedback, the melting, because when the the white cover that reflects sunlight back into space is gone it absorbs more heat and thus warms the air up more. It's the albedo re refractive effect. So um, it's an accelerating process. <clears throat> the last report provided much more precise estimates of sea level rise from 0 .0 0 0.07 inches annually between um, the last 100 years and it accelerated to 0.13 inches annually. At the current rate, accelerated sea level rise could be three feet, and then the worst case, five feet by the end of the century. This is gonna be bad if that's the case. You can see here increasing ocean content and global average sea level change. Just another way of reflecting it. And what's concerning is that, again, it's the acceleration. So I don't actually, I didn't put the uh, time frame in here, but you can see this is over the last 100 years. And with that, the decrease in ocean pH is becoming a problem for uh, uh, sea life and then salinity patterns, which are really, really difficult to, to drill down on, the science of that. But um, anyone who has any background in chemistry knows if you're gonna mess with something like the pH this much in such a large system, um, it can cause all sorts of problems. We're not gonna see things happen uniformly. And I think that's another key teaching point, um, particularly in areas that are very dry or very wet. Um, the contrast in precipitation between wet and dry regions um, will increase, although there'll be major um, uh, regional ex exceptions. 
So there's some of the data, and that's a little bit of the dry part of the lecture, but I thought it's so important because it's new. It just came out in the last six weeks, and this is what's really the basis that's driving the conversation. So let's move into talking about how this affects health, because this is where we come in. Well, what we're doing is we're morphing the bell curve of our environment. And you can see here, um, the new climate has a much broader bell curve, and this is particularly temperature. So you're seeing much more hot weather and then much more extreme hot weather. So let's take a case example. And in this case, it was well beyond historical experience. And what we're seeing here is the European heat wave of 2003. To be clear, it's very difficult to say this was caused by climate change, right? I mean, I think that's not the point here. The point is to say, look what happened here. We can expect much more of these events happen um, with rising temperatures. And when you think about it in Paris, right, the reason this happened, the reason this was so bad is that there was, it wasn't just hot weather over 100 degrees for a week. It was the fact that the community had no resiliency built into it. It was a resource-rich nation. It was Paris. It was France. But they didn't have the ability to um, understand that, like maybe in places like even Denver or certainly New York or in tropical areas, certainly that they have to ramp up the public health establishment. It's time to open up the shelters and crank open the AC. People didn't know that they needed to hydrate themselves um, to the degree. The elderly certainly didn't have a sense of how to keep themselves cool when they're living in very, some places, you know, 100 or even older apartments in um, some of the, the poor sections of Paris. So there was a failure on all parts, and it led to more than 12,000 deaths in France alone attributed to that. Most of those deaths came from the elderly. Again, that sense of vulnerability. We're going to focus a little bit more on that. Um, but it wasn't just the elderly, it was people with chronic diseases. And these, this is a heart study out of the Harvard School of Public Health. This is the numbers that are hard to get to. People that die of heat stroke, it's somewhat straightforward. Um, it's drilling down on the comorbidities. And when someone dies of CHF or diabetic complications, you know, that might be the medical record and the ultimate cause of death. But how much of that was pushed, right? Physiologic reserve, fragility, vulnerability. How much of that was pushed by these external stressors? And you can see here, 4% for diabetes, 3.8 with heart attack, 3.7 with chronic lung disease. They estimate for every one degree increase in summer temperature, an additional 10,000 deaths per year. There's increasing evidence linking sea warming with greater hurricane activity in the Atlantic region. Now, that, that actually was part of the IPCC that they stratified. The reason is, is that the Atlantic data is so much better than the rest of the world, simply because the U.S. is out there, NOAA's flying planes and all these hurricanes. <clears throat> if you remember what Jim Baylock said, he referred to this study by Munich RE. Munich RE is the insurance company that insures insurance companies. And based on their own internal risk assessment, it's a done deal for them. They're calculating now all this climate change um, and violent weather into their own um, insurance assessments. You can say that that's all that's probably in their self-interest, but um, certainly that, that's, the, that's the decision that they've made and they're, they're backing it up um, in, with their data, the data that exists. I thought this was interesting. This is not the best study in the world, but you're seeing increased Storm activity and all these are all disasters that are thought to be related to climate, um, related disasters, floods and landslides and so forth from extreme weather. But earthquakes, and I think this is probably this little upbeat is, uptick is the CNN effect that we just are fully aware of everything happening all anywhere, 24 hour, 24 seven. Um, but it just goes to show earthquakes, which are, as far as we know, aren't climate related. Um, other disasters. Um, have they attributed to climate change, and there's a, there's a much larger increase. So it's just interesting. Not the best study, but still illustrative of a good point. Tropical cyclones in the Atlantic have had documented increase in intensity, more Category 4 and Category 5 storms. And although not scientific, right, this is all fresh in our minds, what's happening right now in the Philippines. Um, this was, depending on the, how you measure it, either the fourth or the most extreme winds that a hurricane has ever generated, that we've ever recorded. Um, and you can see here, this is a, when it hits 157 miles an hour, it's a category five. So we've reached category bad, right? And we saw this last year in New York. I had just left 
where I live, my apartment uh, building was flooded with six feet of water in the East Village. Um, the largest recorded storm in history, um, more than 250 people lost their lives, 65 billion in immediate, in immediate damage. But the thing I wanted to bring up is the story of these two buildings. This is Bellevue Hospital and this is NYU Medical Center. These are the places that I trained. And one of the pride points of Bellevue is that there's no locks on the door. And that's because it never closes. It's been open uh, in set, since 1736, probably longer if you go back to some of the almshouses that the Dutch had that in Bellevue inherited. <clears throat> but its mission is to take care of the, uh, the poor, the immigrants, uh, the prisoners, people that have no other recourse to health care. And Bellevue's generators were on the top floor. Maybe this was Tish. I'm mean, getting confused. But either way, um, their generators were on the top floor. But what they didn't plan, and how could you, right? This is the essence of a disaster, that the power cables ran through the basement. When the power cables shorted out, thus the hospital shorted out. Both of these were closed for at least nine months. Um, think about the impact on health that that has. And that's not always directly measured. All those people that were getting their primary care, diabetes care, that had no other place to go, now had no place to go. Um, I know this well because the hospital I left, Cornell, saw a huge upsurge in emergency department visits. But Cornell is a different hospital. It's not a place where people, uh, immigrants, can go without, act without uh, insurance and get, get um, consistent health care. Vulnerability. Clim cities and climate are co-evolving in a manner that will put more populations at risk. Um, two big trends, which anyone in public health is, I'm sure, very familiar with. One, we're all getting older. And this is going to be, I was lecturing to some students a couple weeks ago, and I said, this is your future. The world median age is increasing. And the way you look at that data. And in 2008, more and more people are living in cities, right? This was the cross point between the urban, uh, rural, Mark, where more people live in cities than in the country for the first time in the history of, of humanity. And the reason that that's concerning is that there's all sorts of vulnerabilities that cities bring. And particularly when we're looking at heat waves, we think of the urban heat island. And the, uh, the concept is, is that cities hold heat more intensely and longer than being in rural areas, the heat island effect. Here's a great study from Phoenix. What better place to study heat? And you can imagine. You have the historic Anglo Phoenix, which is full of gardens and um, houses with yards and parks, and Black Canyon Freeway, which, as it sounds, is a place that's um, where it's a lower socioeconomic group, um, lots of blacktop, very very poor access to, to green space. These are the mean summertime temperatures. Now it's Phoenix, so you figure, okay, there's some they're used to this. This isn't so out of normal. But look what happens in a heat wave. Okay, just to illustrate the discrepancy between historical Anglo Phoenix went up five degrees and the other went up 12 degrees. So in areas with less greenery, it, it, it's worse. It, it, the, the heat island effect is exacerbated in places that are pretty much 100% correlated with lower socioeconomic um, areas. Same thing with zo ozone. Heat, in, heat island impacts on air pollution have been correlated with temperature. And they're looking at ozone. And ozone, for those that may not know, is a, is a big trigger for, for a respiratory disease and asthma. One group even studied aeroallergens and showed a, um, an increase in aeroallergens um, with uh, heat island and carbon dioxide dome impact, city domes um, on, on ragweed, which is one of the big culprits. And there's a discrepancy between the urban, suburban, and rural areas. And last year was one of the worst aeroallergen years on record. I mean, again, we think of health, you don't always think of aeroallergens as being a climate-induced thing, but anyone who suffers from seasonal allergies knows. I mean, there's not much you can do when you're just miserable from allergies, right? It's morbidity. It causes, uh, you know, it takes away from one's uh, healthy, healthy living and lifestyle. You can see here, ragweed is actually having a boom up north, longer growing seasons in larger latitudes. We're going to talk a little bit about more of this in a, in a, in a few slides, particularly as related to agriculture and, and food. Moving on, extreme weather events. What we see are in the areas that get rain, we're seeing heavier rains. In the areas that are dry, we're seeing more drought conditions. 
And the simple way to explain this is that there's just more energy into the system. When there's more energy in the storm system, you're going to have more intense storms. And you can see here, here's the observational record of heavy rain events. And of course, you know, one of the main, mainstays of public health is to separate bathrooms from living space, right? From, from drinking water, from bath water. That's sort of the, a bedrock principle of public health. When you have these extreme down, heavy downpours, those, those veneers get mixed. And that causes all sorts of problems, all sorts of exposure to bacteria and so forth, as well as agricultural runoff, which we're going to talk about has some problems. Even in New York, New York City, one of the largest urban areas in the country, you knew you, wouldn't, you, you shouldn't drink the water after a heavy downpour, even a normal heavy downpour in the summer, because the New York City sewer systems were legendary for being overwhelmed for those 10 or 15 minutes, and then they reached equilibrium after that. Um, but for areas of the world that do not have you know, robust um, sewer systems and robust water treatment systems, I mean, this is, gonna, this, this is something that's not going to be so um, overcome in minutes. It, it'll be a much longer time frame with much greater exposures. Floods, landslides, mud flows, this is just one event that we can expect more of these. Uh, a uh, anecdote from Mumbai in 2005 leading to greater than 1,000 deaths. For those of us here, we know very well the effects of forest fires and drier climates um, and what that means. Children, elderly, pregnant women, pre people with pre-existing respiratory diseases are the ones that are most vulnerable. And you can see here, these are pictures from Colorado Springs. And they're not just local effects. In 2001, uh, Increase in the incidence of asthma in the Caribbean and aspergillosis were linked to um, exceptionally dry and windy conditions over the Sahara. Harmful algae blooms. Increased water temperature, increased nutrient runoff from extreme weather events lead to a perfect storm for algae where they have all this food and all this warm water they mix and algae, they have no, um, no um, problems um, propagating and they just explode in these huge algae blooms. And the byproducts of these algae blooms, many of them have neurotoxic effects and are injurious to human health. Here's a picture from Lake Erie, which I thought was actually cool. I don't know, I didn't realize they had a filter that could see this on the satellites, but this is a uh, algae bloom in Lake Erie. This is, for those that are one of the oriented, this is Cleveland down here, the city of Cleveland. And the thing that most people are talking about, this is sort of the, the intuitive one, is that in warmer weathers, all of the tropical diseases that are in the tropics are now in, marching forward to the subtropics and the temperate latitudes, putting more people at risk, people that have historically never had to deal with these diseases. There's good studies to suggest that in the um, East African highlands, we're seeing more um, Infect, uh, mosquito borne infectious disease, uh, malaria, and dengue due to temperature, just, uh, temperature increases. And then, even just last year, here's sort of the summary of what, what we were seeing. Um, in a place that has been ravaged by biodiversity, Madagascar has seen a huge increase in malaria. Um, we just talked about the increase in vector borne disease in the East African highlands. Birds in Alaska were found to have avian malaria, something that they had never been seen before. Uh, malaria was diagnosed the first time in southern Europe in decades, and dengue in Portugal for the first time in over 100 years. And look at Missouri. This is the, this is the um, range of the uh, Axiotes scapularis, the, um, the tick that carries Lyme disease. It's predicted by the middle of the next century that Missouri will be endemic just from encroachment uh, due to warming weather, allowing them to encroach across the mountains. A physician in Georgia said about cholera and dysentery, it's not just a summer disease, it's becoming a spring and fall disease now. And some surprises are in store. Cryptococcus gadii, which had been a tropical and subtropical tropical disease, um, has been seen with harmful effects in the Pacific Northwest. 
pulmonary cryptococcus, uh, cerebral um, meningitis as well. And as we think about raising temperatures and health, um, probably one of the biggest um, issues, particularly in those vulnerable areas around the world, is in food security. And this is, a, this is actually going to have a huge impact because uh, food insecurity is one of, the, of course, the drivers of poor health and um, um, all the, uh, the UN markers of, healthy, of health. And you can see here, now, if you're a farmer in Canada or in Russia, you may say, okay, actually, we're going to be doing pretty well. And in fact, I'm always amused by the National Geographic articles with the farmers in Greenland holding up bumper crops of stuff that they couldn't have possibly grown 10 or 15 years ago, these quaint little Eskimo type farmers holding up corn or something. But it's not an even sum game. It's not, it's not, you take from here, you're gonna benefit here. That's not how it works. What we're losing is the most biodiverse and rich areas of the world are, we're losing our ability to, um, their, their fruit growing ability, and we're replacing it with still places that are not used. They're still temperate, they have less sunlight. And it's, um, um, and you can see here, the cereal yields are not gonna be a net, a net zero. There's a net negative. And there's good evidence to suggest that elevated carbon dioxide on, um, will affect protein concentrations of food crops. Shifting heat and salinity patterns are altering the other breadbasket of the world, the oceans. And that's, this is multifactorial, overfishing, pollution, waste dumping, changes in salinity and acidity. Um, but still are certainly contributing to the collapse of the fisheries and uh, increasing food insecurity. And then finally, um, mental health. You have to consider that. It's whether it's post-disaster or anticipatory. Um, the, I think it's almost every other day in the major newspapers you're hearing something about climate change and, um, um, and that can cause a lot of consternation certainly for those that are, that are reading these articles. So. If you haven't been paying attention until now, now is the, sort of the money slide. Um, we've talked about t temperature rise, sea level rise, hydrologic extremes, what that does to the environment, and here is the health effects that we see from that. Okay, this is the money slide that sort of summarizes um, the story. But it's not the entire story. Again, we're going back to that issue of vulnerability. This is a wonderful quote that I think is, uh, it's really important here, us, here as we speak in this resource-rich environment. In a recent report from the World Bank, as coastal cities of Africa and Asia expand, many of their poorest residents are being pushed to the edges of livable land into the most dangerous zones for climate change. Their informal sediments cling to the riverbanks and cluster in low-lying areas with poor drainage few public services and no protection from storm surges, sea level rise, and flooding. I mean, this is the issue, right? This, we're, as the population grows, we're increasing our vulnerability. And now we get into that area of climate justice, and what does that mean? Well, this is us. We compare it with that. And we can go back and say, well, you know, look at the impact. The impact is everywhere. Well, for sure. I mean, in, this, in North America, it's going to require spectacular spending on infrastructure and the damage from these, from these heat-related events, the most obvious ones being the hurricanes, the ones that the media focuses on the most, are huge, absolutely massive. But it's going to be different whether we live in a place like New York or even Shanghai versus Bangladesh. Right, two of the three groups there have a fighting chance. They're talking about building seawalls in New York Harbor to mitigate against future storm surge. Okay. Um, but there's vulnerability to be found here as well. And we've seen this in 2005, right? This is, these are um, from Katrina. You could say, well, oh, yeah, it was a, that was an isolated disaster and then eventually people got the help that they needed. But let's look at New Orleans 2005 today. And these are very powerful graphic. Okay. So think about what that means to uproot the place that you grew up, your home, your social network, your family, et cetera, et cetera, and forced to live someplace else. And we can see more of this. 
um, it's going to be the most vulnerable that are going to be hit the hardest and forced to and forced to migrate. And perhaps most scary is this. Now, I told you I was interested in wilderness medicine, and one of the fun things I like to do is, you know, you like to go to the ge geographic extremes. So as a mountain climber, um, you're going to get a good bang for your buck in the Maldives because all you really need to do is walk up three meters. That's the highest point in the Maldives, the island chain south of India. Um, but in the Maldives and all throughout the South Pacific are these low-lying lying island chains where we know it's a matter of when, not necessarily if, that these people all have to move. They've actually actually are now beginning resettlement uh, zones in New Zealand and Australia for their communities to be able to at least have a fighting chance to stay together. People go back and forth on these numbers, but even, I mean, even if you took away the seven and it was just five million islanders are forced to relocate, it's still a huge number, right? Um, and we know this is coming. I think that the question is exactly when this is coming. One of the most powerful ways, I think, to talk about climate change is in this way of threat multipliers. Um, and I think it's important because you can still confer how bad something like this is going to be without having to prove causality. And what I mean by that is, um, and I take this from our, our colleague Skip Burkle, climate change and resource scarcity are rarely the so-called cause, in this case of violent conflict where he's done his work, but it makes bad things worse. Again, it goes back to that issue of vulnerability. And here's some of his data. Warmer years are linked to an increase in civil wars, an increase in armed conflict, and increase in food and fuel um, price spikes. All right. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, despite the overwhelming scientific evidence of global warming, climate change is still not an accepted scientific fact for the American public. Um, and you can see here, a Gallup poll, 54 Americans believe the effects of climate change have already begun, with only 24% believing that the news on climate change science is accurate. So we, we, we as a, a, in the health sector, really have our work cut out for us. And we don't have time, because here's, here's, here's us, here's where we are now, and this is where we're headed. Right? This is the driver of everything. So no matter how much mitigation we can come up with, it's still going to, the problem is going to be made worse as these extra, how many different, three billion people, two and a half billion people are going to need cars, jobs, factories, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is the driver. This is the part where you all speak up. <laughs> we need solutions. So I think the first part is we we in the public health sector should, should control the message. Rather than framing this in save the whales, love Mother Earth, or even allowing um, sound bites to leak out in parts per million of something which most of the public can't quite fathom. It's very difficult. We've had a lot of data here, and I know it's hard for you to understand. It's hard for me to understand. What does 400 parts per million mean? What does $6.7 billion really mean? Um, but I tell you what has meaning for most people is uh, their family's risk of lung disease and cancer and their children's risk of asthma. And like I said at the beginning, we've, we've been conspicuously absent, particularly those of us that are clinicians, about issues of climate change. And many of us have viewed it as an abstract threat. I'm not sure why. I think a lot of it has to do with um, the political um, um, prejudices that have been associated with climate change. But I think that's changing. I think we have an exceptional opportunity to change individual and collective action. And essentially, this is the money slide. There was that other one that was the info. This is the action slide. Someone asked me if this picture was, re was, was real. I, I don't know. Right? But this is it. And it's not just us talking about it, right? This came out of Time Magazine this summer. And there's, there's background in this, right? We have experience with this. We know, um, we in medicine, and whether it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or anyone who works in the field of medicine still has that aura of wearing the white coat, that fulcrum of the white coat. And we see this every day in the emergency room. We say to our patients, 
boy, you need, you know, it looks like you're going to need surgery. It looks like you should take this aspirin. What do they say to us? What do they say? They say, okay, doc. All right. Most of them say, okay. You know, it's almost unlike any other profession because the doctor-patient relationship, we still have that. They don't say, well, what's your take? What percentage are you getting out of this? You know, like we have with many of the other professions that we're in, or that we interact with in, in society. Um, we're educators. All day long, I explain things in very straightforward terms. I don't go into the chemical pathways of drugs and how they interact with, with disease and pathology. I say, well, looks like you have a blockage here, and what this drug does is that it helps prevent the blockage, and that's how you get the blood which you need to keep your heart healthy. Okay, that's what we do. We, we, we spend a lot of time communicating to the public. And so I think about this, and I say, you know, we need jobs, we need responsible energy, but what we can't have is allow our constituents to sit and euphemize about something like clean coal. I think that's where we need to step in and say, it's okay to have coal as part of our energy strategy. Many of our family members need jobs. But what needs to change is our risk assessment. Let's really understand what a coal plant is going to do to our health, and then we'll actually have a chance to move forward. I think this is the precondition, and I'm stuck here. This is what I think. I, I can't even think beyond that until we have better under, a better uh, understanding of this um, in our society. But I think we're the exceptionally uh, positioned people to talk about responsible energy, to talk about the effects of air pollution um, and the risks that we have from global climate change, the loss of biodiversity and that, what that means for our families and our health, access to clean water and extreme weather. I take a page from history. Now, some of you may not remember this, some of the young folks in the room, but um, in the early 80s, there was a scary time in the Cold War where the doctrine of a winnable nuclear war came out in the early 80s. It was all that Ronald Reagan, and uh, in some ways it was, it was a, one of the worst times since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then what happened was a few physicians from both Russia and the United States and the West came together and said, look, this is an epidemic which will have no meaningful solution and will be the final epidemic. And they framed this as a public health issue. They framed nuclear proliferation as a public health issue. And because of that, they were able to stick to the science and in many ways unassailable from either side because they were acting as um, advocating for the public health. And they were very effective. Their message was clear. It resonated and in many ways helped contribute to the end of the Cold War. And they won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. I think that's the potential that we have. This is a complex um, issue with many facets, with many people having a, a skin in the game and a stake in this. But I think um, we as health educators and as health practitioners have an exceptional opportunity. We talked about this being a mainstream issue. We talked about climate change being framed as a human welfare and, and health issue. We talked about the opportunity cost being exceptionally high. For those that are interested in a good resource until the IPCC health um, report comes out next year, the um, National Climate Assessment is a document of 13 federal agencies. It's very well written. It's not onerous. It's relatively short, the health section, I mean. It's a great place to get primary research from the people that are doing it on health effects. Many of the authors are actually going to contribute to the book that we're editing with my colleague uh, George Luber at the CDC. If, uh, if these same brilliant authors actually hand in their drafts, we'll have this book to you next year. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague George at the CDC for a lot of this information and some others. Um, I'm just across campus in the Department of Emergency Medicine and uh, our academic um, uh, activities in wilderness medicine. And here's an easy email if anyone wants to get in touch. Thanks for having me, and I'll take questions.
Northern Michigan and went to Michigan State College at that time when I was young and uh, uh, studied chemical engineering and then got military and all sorts of things ended up here. But anyway, as I remember at that time, they had uh, a room where they controlled the atmosphere in, inside the room and uh, they controlled the oxygen percentage, they controlled the uh, carbon dioxide percentage and the heat and, and that sort of thing. And the thing that I still remember from that is that uh, uh, when they uh, had regular air, of course the plants all move at the same rate and so forth as they do, but uh, when they cut out the carbon dioxide, the plants all shriveled and, and, and died. And uh, because uh, apparently the plants uh, need carbon dioxide and they use up most of what's, what's in the atmosphere. And similarly, they adjusted the oxygen and nitrogen and so on. But that much I still remember. And uh, uh, it, it kind of bothers me then when they talk about carbon dioxide as being a pollutant of the atmosphere. I think we have uh, plants to save us from uh, getting uh, too much carbon dioxide. And I was wondering what you th think of that. that uh, you know, I go back to the bell curve. You know, there's, a, there's an ideal place that the planet has evolved for carbon dioxide. What's happening is now we're going into that area. Like, you know, uh, go back to the emergency room. Oxygen, we need oxygen to live. It's vital for our process one of the most vital things we have. Too much oxygen is a, it's toxic to your body and it can cause all sorts, re, reap all sorts of havoc with free radical damage. And we know that and I think it's, it's analogous. It's just, we're just getting to that point of the bell curve where it's too much. And what we're seeing is plants are no longer thriving. Some are, um, but it's asymmetric and it's causing all sorts of um, other effects too. Because it's not just isolated carbon dioxide, or it's the whole system that's out of whack concomitantly. Mr. Jobin. Okay. Um, I think we have to be, we're, we're maintaining an apolitical status here, which is crucial to this whole concept. And terminology is so important. Because I agree, calling CO2 a poisonous gas is it grates against science. And yet, the bell curve shows in excess it's not good. It's like excess of oxygen, it's not good. So we have to be careful, but we don't control the press. And the press speaks a lot of these, these things. And so I think. As, as physicians, having an organization that's apolitical might help a lot in promoting sort of what's happening. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. What The Wilderness Medical Society was founded by practitioners of wilderness medicine. I'm, I'm the current president, for those that didn't know that. Um, and my sense is that this group of physicians is, a, is very well positioned to embrace this area. You know, perhaps maybe ID is another natural fit, but that's just kind of what I think. I've been moderately, probably less than moderately successful at making that transition and making that case. Um, so I think you're right. I don't know if it's time for a, you know, Physicians for Social Responsibility is out there. They have a lot on their plate. Is it time for a separate organization? But I totally agree. It has to be health and science based. That's, that's been the guiding light for even my modest in, um, you know, interactions with the Wilderness Medical Society. Because once you have an agenda, you know, you're political, and then you're, we know what that's like these days. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Some of these slides, I'm sure the wording is less than um, towing the line, um, to your point. Yes, sir. So like any public health epidemic, the approach uh, is to look at the major risk factors for what the cause is. So with the United States contributing one quarter of this, what are the three or five greatest causes of this problem? Is it cars? Is it cars or is it cars? I mean, what is it? So that one can then take the correct epidemiologic approach to many cases against risk factors. Despite all the political and economic barriers that that may bring, that's how we should approach this. What are, so what are the risk factors? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's uh, the big five? you know, coal plants, the airline industry is notorious because of the type of fuel that they burn. Automobiles, just the sheer number 
And we're not even talking here. We're actually talking about the growth areas of China and India. It's cars and automobiles. Um, so those are the big ones. Um, in terms of what we do, I mean, if you're asking me, I do some work with the Institute of Medicine, and everyone is there is, is clamoring for a clean, you know, green energy initiative, you know, like the Marshall Plan or one of these big things, which I don't think the political will, will exist in 2013 for that. But that's the idea, is to do something large and grand, a Manhattan Project, to have it be economically feasible in the long term, even medium to long term, to get off of a carbon-based economy to the degree that we are now. And then how can one turn that information into a message? I mean, the reason that Chasing Ice is so powerful is you know, what, what he's done is it's such a concrete example that that nobody can deny. I mean, I went to his thing on Monday night at the Denver Post, mm. Jim Lyle's thing, and he talked about how he showed this in Utah, and some old guy got up with a pat on some good old boy, 75 years old, and, and he got up and he listened and he, he saw the presentation, he goes, oh, I get it. Mm. And then afterward, the guy's daughter went up to him and said, do you know who that was? And he goes, no, he said, he is the single most influential person who's laid down more, more pipe and gas and oil in the Western United States than anybody on the planet. So it was because of the incredible concrete, profound image that Chasey Nice had. It's like you can't deny what you see here. So how do you take that kind of an imagery, which is simple for anybody to understand, even a 75-year-old wildcat who's completely embedded into what he's done for most of his professional life, how do you take that message into, this is what we have to do about cars. This is what we have to do about you know, the other forces that are causing this problem. Like most it's a great people. question. You know, this is a little wonky, right? There's a lot of science data here. That's probably not the best for public consumption. This, but, yeah, but, the, the, won't do it, like you said. but the But the info is there, right? The link between, it's all there. Now it's just coming up with a compelling narrative to explain how this stuff affects health and to get personal about it. And it's actually interesting because I talked to Jim Baylog when he was here at the Altitude Center. We sat down for uh, 20 minutes with him. And we just started talking about this. His next move, you know what it is? It's going to health. He's, gonna, he, he's trying to come up, and we we're going back and forth on, you know, would that mean he films rural India with people with respiratory disease, or does it mean he comes to the ED during, during a, um, a heat wave? I don't think there was a clear answer, but the idea is he's going to take this very powerful narrative. He's an outstanding storyteller with what we know is a compelling action item for people, which is what my whole shtick is, which is link this to health because it's a lot more powerful than any other the messages that are out there in terms of personal, um, the fulcrum for personal change. So maybe it's a combination of those things. I hope so. I hope he calls me back because we exchange cards. Can you talk briefly about the, the spread of vector-borne infectious diseases? And I'm wondering if you, if you see or foresee a, a greater disease burden in the places that those are already endemic with climate change as well. Oh, the places that are already endemic. Um, I can't speak to that. I don't know the data that, had, that if the data has supported that. Like if in equatorial areas, there's more uh, malaria burden from that. I, I, I haven't come across that. It's really places that haven't seen it are now seeing it. And populations, more, more importantly, populations that are not used to it and are unprepared for it are now being exposed to it. It's a great question, though. I just don't know the answer. Anyone else does?
And that's the question, right? And I, I think it goes back to trust. You, you have to be a, a source that people trust. And to Dr. Jobin's point, it was you, you, you can't be seen as political because as soon as you're political, half the people will stop listening to you no matter what, what you say. And so I think that's the key. I think the key is to be health-oriented and science-oriented and let the chips fall where they may. But the message, if you stick to that, I think the message is still pretty straightforward. Um, that's where it has to begin. They have to be able to listen to you. And I don't have a lot of faith in that right now, except, you know, from going back and thinking about the steadfast, um, steadfast steadfastness of the public health in the face of the tobacco. Um, and you all could probably speak to this more than I could. Um, the pressure that the tobacco industry, the truth always rises, right? I guess the question is, is it too late? And there's, is, there, is the damage done? Um, but just to your, to your point, I think it, if you create a platform that's, that is um, where they can accept you into their, their political circle, um, then I think you have a fighting chance. I think as soon as you get political about it, it's over. It's hard. You see, you say that, but there's like there, a lot of politicians do that calculus and see it as a zero sum game. If I go into this camp, then I'll lose all my funding from the Wildcatter or otherwise. I, I, I struggle with that. I think it's a very good, good point. And I think you have to find those. Almost, you almost need a full political operative team to sort of seek out where individual vulnerabilities for politicians lie. And then you can say, this is an issue that this person could back. And from there, you could create it. But I think it's almost individual calculus. Where does their funding come from? That's, I mean, maybe I'm cynical. But um, you, you certainly don't see it. I think the progress that we've made is that most people it's hard for people to deny that climate change is not man-made. There's a lot of people do it, but it's getting harder. I still don't see the proactive arm of that happening anytime soon. But you know, I have a very amateurish outside view of that too. So, Jeff, got one more. Have you thought or you have any data on the coal seam fire and the natural sources of CO2? I've done some reading there are really pretty massive that are sort of geologic half lightning strikes. Underground fires in the last few years. Is there is there a number that's in your head at all that has to trace that to what production is of CO two? So the, the blame is a hard issue. Right. Blame. I think you, it's historical record is to me the most powerful data. You know we've seen those epic fluctuations over an ice age, right? And it goes from off the top of my head, we can pull it up the slide, but never greater than two hundred eighty parts per million. It's been between two hundred and two hundred eighty for. Um, you know, millions and millions and millions of years. And then since 1850, we, we, uh, we, we hit 300 and now we're at 400, and that's in 150 years. So that's hard to explain away that natural processes, assuming had been there that whole time. Um, but, but I can't, I don't know the exact data on what, where the natural process is, what percentage of those natural fluctuations it is, I don't know that. Yes, sir. You had an early slide about albedo, and I wondered if you had an opinion about some of the proposals to nebulize seawater into the clouds yeah, and uh, slow down global warming. There's bites. a guy. There's a guy named Clive. Maybe you know his book, his work. He's out of Australia, and I'm reading his book now. And he's a climate engineer, and they're talking about aerosolizing seawater to get it in. The numbers that he proposes to, to make a dent in that 
are, I think, you know, you would need a, they're just astronomical. So from an engineering point of view, I think, um, I think the question is, could we do it? Yes, we could. Would, how much would it cost? It would be a, uh, it would be like mobilizing for World War II. Um, one is the political will exist, and then two, does it make sense to create an entire industry to counteract another entire industry that we know is bad? So it gets existential. Um, Jay, thank you. It looks like we're being invaded. <laughs> thank you.